got a great show for you today, and we're going to talk about all things codependency, narcissism, and all that kind of stuff that people have to deal with and other folks, and, and we've got a great person to explain it all to us. She's written three books. Um, she is a family counselor, and um, her name is um, Darlene Lancer, and Darlene, welcome to the show. How are you? Oh, I'm good. I'm looking forward to uh, this discussion. Really, I, I am as well. <laughs> so let, let's talk about you uh, a little bit because that's, you know, kind of like while you're here. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, you are a family therapist and you are a marriage counselor mm -hmm. and you've worked, you've been doing this for since you were, I think you were 10 when you started. So you've been doing yeah. it for about 30 years. Mm -hmm. Well, when I, yeah, right. When I was 12, I thought I wanted to be a psychiatrist. So, well, I love yeah. the work that you're doing though, because you're doing, you're doing, you're doing some really good work for people um, to get out of under, to get out of codependent relationships and, and some of the negative stuff that, and some of the negative baggage that we bring along. Right. Right. In fact, you mentioned my three paperbacks that are behind me. But I've written about seven ebooks also. Oh, cool. On how to be assertive, how to raise your self esteem, how to forgive yourself, how to overcome perfectionism. Uh, so there's, I, I like to give people tools. So all my books are workbooks. Oh, that's, that, that's awesome. So if they would like to, uh, um, if they would like to look at all of your ebooks and all of your writings and stuff, uh, that would be darlenelancer.com, correct? And they can go. And Either look at there, right there or what is codependency.com. Ah, very good. And I what? also have webinars and audio files for them too. So. Oh, very nice. And we appreciate that. And, and I just love that you've got a beautiful website. So go there, darlenelancer.com. And, uh, you. <laughs> and you are, you're working very hard to help. And one of the things that we like to talk about here is that you're working very hard to change the world one person at a time to make their lives a little bit better so that they, we can get rid of the, what I call the seven generation, um, the seven generational rule, which is that what happens to your father happens to your son, happens to your father, happens to your, until the cycle is broken. And you're working to break the cycle of, of people with low esteem and, and, uh, and to help them get rid of codependency and that sort of thing. I wanted to ask you though, what is codependency? What is your definition of codependency? Well, yes, it is my definition because there is not one definition. So my definition is someone whose thinking and behavior revolves around another person, a process or a substance. So to me, that includes addicts, uh, whether they're uh, addicted to food or work or gambling or sex. Uh, so it's a substance, a process, or, you know, traditionally it would only be to another person. So your thinking and your behavior revolves around someone else rather than stemming from your innate self, what you feel, what you want, what you need. And starting from the inside out, everything is reversed. You try to figure out what the other person needs and wants, and then you act accordingly. It's kind of upside down. Why is it that we do that to ourselves? <laughs> That's a very good and deep question. And it starts really in childhood, sometimes even in infancy. So healthy parenting uh, for the mother or the main caretaker of a baby and a toddler, the, the parent is supposed to attune to the baby and meet its needs and mirror it. So if the baby's happy, it's smiling. If the baby's sad, it comforts it. Uh, if it's scared, it kind of imitates the baby's fear and comforts it. So there's mirroring and then there's help. And parent has to do both. So if a parent has a mental illness, uh, personality disorder, if they're addicted, if they're just too busy and neglectful. Uh, there's all kinds of ways with that can be disrupted. And the, the parent is not doing that, is not attuning to the baby. If you're codependent, you're not going to be able to do that either. So you're going to end up parenting the way you were parented. You're going to use your child for your own self-esteem and not respond to that 
child is an independent being that it is, uh, an in, infant and a child needs to feel that it's loved by both parents for who they are. And a lot of parenting is conditional. It's like, if they don't uh, do what the parent wants, they withhold love. Or is it, they're only proud when they are an A student or an athlete or successful. So in some way, doing what the parent wants, going to the school that they want, et cetera. So a withholding love as a punishment is very detrimental. So all that is shaming. There's um, many ways that a parent could shame a child and that's trauma. And then the child learns to adapt to the parent, give them what they want just for survival. So that's another way that codependency uh, becomes a personality style. It's learned behavior in order to survive and cope in that dysfunctional family environment. If you're listening to this podcast and you're a young person and you're contemplating either you just got married or, or you're in your 20s and you're thinking about having a child and it's your first child, I highly suggest that you go talk to someone who can help you understand. Because, you know, Darlene, we're asking, we're asking kids that are barely out of diapers themselves to make decisions for other human beings, and they may have no earthly idea in anything like what they're doing because they're kids and they haven't been through it yet. And that's, that's why talking to someone like you can be so vital so that they can learn proper parenting mm -hmm. skills so that we don't repeat another generation going down the same road. And so when you're talking to kids, young people that are having, first of all, <laughs> does anybody come to you and say, we're contemplating having a child, you need to educate us? <laughs> no way. And frankly, I wish I had written my books before I had my first child that was only 23. Oh, wow. And, uh, for an example, you know, I had uh, one of my children had colic and was crying a lot. Much later, I found out that it was an allergy or something to the milk or whatever. But I took it personally. I felt rejected. So that's an immature response because of my own self-esteem issues. So that's a perfect example of my own codependency. It's like I was needing that validation for my, my baby. And instead of responding in a, in a healthy way, so in a comforting way, you know, I was feeling rejected. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, I can understand that. And, and it's, that's, that when you're, especially a colicky baby, but I get that it's, it's hard. It's, it can be really hard. Um, but uh, the work that you do, what is your favorite, your favorite type of, uh, of counseling or, or therapy that you like to do? Well, I enjoy what I'm doing now, and this is helping people basically individuate. That means to become your own person, basically. So you own your own thoughts, your feelings, your opinions. You go after your dreams. You pursue your own passions based on who you are. And that's all my books are really about that kind of personal transformation, which is something that I've done with myself and working, you know. Before I was a therapist, even though I wanted to be a shrink when I was 12, I went into my, uh, the field of law. So for like 20 oh, wow. years, I was practicing law. And it was such a detour from what I really wanted and who I was and what I should be. So I wanted to be a writer too when I was in college. So eventually, you know, I eventually got around to being back on my path to who I was meant to be. Because when you're in an unhappy relationship or even in a job that doesn't feel right and you're unhappy, you're out of alignment with your, your soul. I call it soul alignment. And you're not meant to, to be that. So if a, if a marriage even falls apart, it may be a good thing because it's not working and there's reasons it's not working. And you have to kind of get back on track to really be able to express yourself fully, who you are. It's sort of like an acorn growing into the oak. So if it's, you know, growing in the wrong direction and thinks it's a pine tree, <laughs> it's not going to grow well. So 
uh, helping people really express who they are and who they're meant to be. And if you're in an abusive relationship, that's totally wrong. You're not meant to, to experience abuse, but to re love and respect yourself. And then you'll attract that. And it's all about, it's part of it is the, the law of attraction. And if you, if you attract negative things by saying negative things and acting in negative ways or letting other people um, run all over you and, and, mm -hmm. and dominate you and, and be a narcissist and, and all, of the, all of those things, then you can't get to where you want to go. It's, it's, it's like saying you want to go to my, my hometown of Seattle, but getting on the road to San Jose. And uh, you end up in San Jose and you're nowhere near Seattle and you can't figure out why. And that's why it's good to talk to someone like you. Right. And the other thing is people don't realize that if they're experiencing disrespect and abuse, they can leave that relationship, but they're going to eventually find out that they are the worst abuser. Because we will we'll allow about as much abuse as we give ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's kind of a funny law of attraction there. So there's a saying like if you're pointing the finger, you know, there's 10 pointing back at you. So you have to really look at yourself. My books are not about finding blame and fault at other people, but how you can take back your power and how you can turn that relationship around and empower yourself, raise your own self-esteem. People say, you know, how can I raise my child's self-esteem? They want to be a better parent. I say, work on your own. Because uh -huh. the more you have self-esteem, the better you'll be able to transmit that and your responses will be healthy with your child. And if you want a healthy relationship, Work on yourself, raise your own self-esteem, and then you'll have someone who has good self-esteem and you won't tolerate disrespect. In fact, research has shown that when people have low self-esteem, the prognosis for the relationship is low. It's not good. Those relationships more often lead to conflict and they don't last. But actually, if you have good self-esteem, if your partner has good self-esteem, it can actually help raise your self-esteem. Exactly. Or, or if you have got good self-esteem, you can help them raise theirs. Yeah. Or, I've been, or not. <laughs> I've been told by some former boyfriends that I raised their self-esteem. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that, that's good. That's good news because they were dating out of their league. <laughs> so. You know, but that's but that's important. Let's let's talk about your third book that you just got out there, and uh, and I I wrote down the name of it kinda, but to tell us the name of the book. Yeah, I can get it here. Show it to your viewers. Dating is a glare. I don't know. Dating, loving, and leaving a narcissist. And you can't read the subtitle. It's essential tools for improving or leaving narcissistic and abusive relationships. So it's not just to be with a narcissist. If you're with any, whoops, well, anyone with a personality disorder or an addict that's abusive, the same principles apply. My first, my marriage was to an alcoholic and a, some of the things I learned are in that book because I was able to totally changed the power dynamics in that relationship. And eventually I left because I was happy, not because I was unhappy. And you were, you were on your own at that point. You were able to, to break free of that. Can you give me a description? I, you know, you hear, I hear it all the time, but, but give me a description of what is a narcissist? Good question. So there's three essential qualities or traits. And one is, that they have an excessive need for admiration. They need constant like praise and admiration from people. The other is a sense of grandiosity. They think they're the greatest, they're the best. Sometimes it's just in fantasy. That they're undiscovered, you know. Uh, and that's one of the reasons they boast a lot or brag a lot. 
So the third one is lack of empathy. So narcissists, um, they can understand intellectually feelings. Sometimes they can have good intellectual and empathy, cognitive, but not at a feeling level, not at an emotional level. And then they need at least five altogether to qualify for narcissistic personality disorder. And that can be one of the following uh, six. It could be arrogance, could be envy. They often envy other people and they think other people are envying them because they're so great. They like to be around high status people like celebrities, people that are successful or powerful or talented. Uh, they want to be uh, associated with high status institutions and entitlements. That's another E. So think of lack of empathy and the entitlement. They think they're above the law or things are not, uh, they're hip, people complain they're hypocritical because they expect more than they give because they're entitled. They shouldn't have to follow the rules. Exploitativeness, they often take advantage of other people. So, that's, and then I mentioned arrogance too. Yes, you mentioned there. That's, that sounds like a hell of a way to live. How does somebody get to be like that? Is that something they learn behavior as growing up, uh, a bad relationship with their folks or whatever it was? How do they get to be, get to be especially the part about empathy? I, that, that boggles my mind that, that you can't be thinking about how, what you're doing, how it is negatively impacting somebody else. Well, that's the age old question of nature versus nurture. They've done a lot of twin studies. And now there's some evidence that it's probably roughly around 50% inherited. So a narcissistic parent may have an offspring that's a narcissist. Uh, usually it's not all the children maybe one. Um, and then there's also the environment. So there's two theories about that also. So one famous th psychoanalyst said, it's for a, a, someone who is, has a parent that's very abusive. And I've seen that in my practice too. And there's another point of view that says, well, it's actually a child that's been indulged. And I've seen that too. Child just, parents didn't say no, they gave the child whatever they wanted. Uh, so, but that doesn't happen in every case. So maybe there's some other factors too. So, so there's almost, a combination. Of things. It's almost a case by case thing then that, that someone can become that. Do they generally have low self-esteem to boot? That's a really good question, because if you ask a narcissist, they'll say they have high self-esteem. Yes, but they can't. <laughs> right. And sometimes the, the, the questionnaires that they would give in research, they would take the answer at face value. And then later, somebody had the bright idea to give them a, a lie a, actually a fake lie detector test. So it wasn't really detecting whether they were lying, but they thought they were being monitored. So then they were more honest and they, they revealed more of their vulnerable feelings about not feeling so great. So all this grandiosity, in fact, just about all of their traits, you could think of as a defense to shame. And I know all about shame since I wrote a book on shame. So... <laughs> You know, envying people, envy is a defense to shame. Often they're perfectionistic. Everything has to be perfect. And the worst is like a narcissistic, perfectionistic spouse who wants you to be perfect too and will criticize you relentlessly about trying to be perfect. And that's a defense to shame. Because if I'm perfect, you can't criticize me. So uh, arrogance is a defense to shame. Entitlement, I'm better hanging around high status people then would lift me up. Grandiosity or boasting. Uh, you can think of their whole personality almost is a defense to shame and they typically have very thin skins. So they're very sensitive 
to anything that sounds like a criticism. Even if it's not, you look at them the wrong way and that could bring on rage because they're easily humiliated and high, very defensive that way. Uh, that, that's amazing. You're describing somebody that um, has been in the public eye for the last little while. <laughs> and I've heard this, I'm not going to go into his name or whatever, but I've heard him being described as a classic narcissist mm -hmm. and uh, thin skinned, uh, quick to anger, uh, no empathy uh, and all, all of that. And that, that really, it, it just makes perfect sense. Well, uh, the, the retribution and vindictiveness also is to try to restore my ego. So if I feel humiliated, I'm going to retaliate and then I can be their power is their main, um, uh, priority because that makes them feel safe inside. They feel very unsafe and vulnerable and, you know, insecure. So I have to be the top dog and I have to dominate and control. Uh, that's not one of the symptoms in the, in the, the mental health, you know, diagnostic code, but it's very typical control and aggression. And so I have to be on top and then I feel safe. So that also, so, so I don't feel insecure. So if I retaliate, then I can be on top. You see. If I put someone down, that like a bully, it elevates me. And now I'm higher and you're lower. Because inside they feel lower. So they have to, you know, reverse the scale. Oh, what a, what a, what a horrible way to live a life. I have to tell you. That Pretty would, unhappy inside. Yeah, I, I would think so. Is there any, have you had experience with somebody that says, you know, Darlene, I think I'm a narcissist and I don't really know why. And I would like to not be that anymore. Can you help them? There is help available. So they may not be able to empathize. That's the one thing that they may not be able to do but they can learn to modify their behavior because to a narcissist, relationships are very transactional. Maybe you've heard that applied to the person you were talking about before. <laughs> uh huh. So a narcissist will prioritize power and sacrifice the relationship to get it. Yeah. So other people will prioritize the relationship and sacrifice themselves to keep it. So everybody around them, you know, it's on eggshells and uh, trying to get along to, you know, to make the relationship work. And the narcissist doesn't care about getting along. Typically, they're very antagonistic. They care about getting ahead. So that's the difference. And in terms of treatment, if you they can, if they see that they're destroying their relationships, maybe they're um, got caught by the government in some criminal activity, or maybe they lost their savings because of mismanagement. If they've had some sort of a setback, that might prompt them to go to therapy and get help. Um, but it's usually because they want to get back on top. They want to be back in power and be happy the way things were before. Um, but if you show them that by changing their behavior, they can be more effective, they can be more successful, they can get people to admire them even. You show them that if they do these other things and act differently, they will get what they want. So it may, you frame it in terms of a transactional, behavioral modification, they can make a lot of improvement. And that's how I, in my book, I explain to people in relationship with narcissists just how to do that. I even have scripts and checklists and strategies of how to change that power dynamic. And, and to make them, but, but at the end of the day, they still want to feel that special feeling of being on top and being the powerful one and all of that kind of stuff, right? Well, you have to make them see that it has to, relationships are a two-way street. Right. 
and you could still pray and you have to praise them when they do well just like a little kid you know <laughs> like a puppy dog you got to train yeah. the puppy dog that's, that's right a good, that's a good dog yeah you so know. if you keep telling your child that they're they're not going to amount to anything and they're bad they're going to act bad you know and they're not going to amount to anything <laughs> yeah and research has shown in in edu education that if teachers expect children not to perform they won't perform well and if they raise their expectations the children perform better so it's all about you know the partner has to also do the work of raising their expectations uh, but knowing how to communicate it in an effective way now when people are forming relationships does a narcissist hide the fact that they are who they are while they're in a dating atmosphere until they get you know everything signed sealed and delivered and then they open themselves up to who they really are or does the person who is dating someone like that tend to overlook it because it's like well they'll get over that or that's okay um, kevin you're asking such good questions oh thank you <laughs> that's why i have a whole chapter on dating ah dating. there you are because one of the things that narcissists do is called impression management. Because they need this admiration and they want you. And by the way, I think that co uh, narcissists are codependent too. They want you to like them. They want you to want to be with them. They want you to listen to them. They want you to respect them. And they work hard to make you do that. And some research has shown that it, in meetings, they had people meet with different uh, subjects, including narcissists. And everybody liked the narcissist until the seventh meeting. And then they started to see signs of the personality they didn't like. So in a dating situation, the narcissist is gonna try even harder than in just a you know, an interview in a test setting. Uh, try even harder to win you over. Maybe for a lot of reasons, sex might be one, or with a woman, maybe she wants gifts or to be taken to expensive restaurants or whatever it is that she wants. And she wants you to admire her and think she's beautiful. So they're gonna try hard. So then after, you've fallen for them, they don't need to work so hard. They don't want to work so hard. And the problem is then they might start fault finding because they want to still be in, maybe you're not admiring them quite as much because now, you know, you're starting to get used to the person. It's just natural. You don't idealize as much after some time. And then they stop idealizing and they start devaluing you. And however, in the clients I have that were married to narcissists and they say, oh, it was wonderful in the beginning. When they look back and in conversations, they see telltale signs. Like maybe this person was rude to the waiter or maybe they um, character assassinated their ex. Maybe they don't talk to people in their family and blame everybody else. Uh, or maybe they are very controlling and, you know, wanted you to look a certain way or things they had to choose where you're going and, and they were or difficult to negotiate with. It had to be their way. You know, they'll say my way or the highway. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so usually they don't. Uh, narcissists don't like to compromise well and i i have uh and tell me if this is a good if this works i used to, i was in the food service industry for a very long time i am kind of sensitive to the fact that these people that are waiting on us the bartenders the cooks the the waiters waitresses the bus people they're working very hard and they and they work hard all the time to try and do a good job for us because that's how they make money that's how they make more money so I always judge somebody who I'm going out to lunch with or going out to dinner with, with how they treat the, basically the hired help. If they are not 
kind and thoughtful and mm-hmm. say yes thank you and mm-hmm. no thank you and may i please and right. stuff i want nothing to do with them because i down the road they're going to treat me the same way that they treat absolutely absolutely well, good. So I'm, I'm glad we're on the same page with that because i've always you know there was a there was a guy that I, I worked with that had claimed to be a a master spiritual teacher and yada 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 and and we go out to lunch and he's mean to the wait staff just because he can it's like, nope, sorry, I'm not going to deal with you at all because I didn't feel like he had empathy for for them or cared, and uh, and he talked down to them because they could lift himself up. I guess he was a narcissist. Yeah. So let's talk about your books again. Now, what got you decided to start writing books? I had written a blog about codependency, ah. and Wiley Publishing uh, – came across that blog. They were looking to write a book, Codependency for Dummies. They read my blog and they asked me to uh, write some chapters and outline and actually compete with some other authors or therapists. And once they asked me to do that, I realized this is what I was doing with my clients for years. This was my own journey too. So I felt very confident and knowledgeable about the subject. Hazelton asked me to write uh, Conquering Shame and Codependency. I wrote a blog on shame is the core of addiction. Ah. And they had read that. And so they wanted me to tailor it to codependency. So I did. And it goes into um, how shame impacts relationships also. And That's- and, and how all of the, just like many of the traits of narcissism are defenses to shame, the same is true of codependency. A lot of the traits of codependence are defenses to shame. So there's a way which it's like the two narcissists and codependents are kind of like mirror images of each other. And I explain that in my book too. That is interesting. What really is interesting is that, that most, most authors, uh, they'll write a manuscript, they'll write a book, and they'll have it edited, and then they then they have to go send it someplace or many places to get somebody to buy you. These people are coming to you, so that means that your information is really spot on, and uh, is is really necessary for for all of us. So I appreciate that. And the third book that is just out that we wanted to talk about again, it involves dating and stuff. What's the name of that book? Oh, it's not just dating; it's dating, loving, and leaving a narcissist. Ah. So, but it applies if you're a parent if, or if you have a child with a narcissistic parent. It's about relationships with narcissists or abusers, as I said, and how to improve them or how to leave them. And it's interrelated because people, it's harder to leave an abusive relationship than a healthy one. People don't realize, realize it. Outsiders will say, well, that person's a jerk. Why don't you just leave? You should leave. That's easy to say. But for a lot of reasons I go into, like trauma bonding and learned helplessness, and there's a lot of factors, it's hard to leave someone that even when they're abusing you. And just because someone's abusing you, you still might love them. So people think that, how could you love someone who's abusive? Well, they're not abusive 24-7. They still might have a lot of positive traits. People yep. enjoy the lifestyle. And, you know, over time, they've developed this relationship. They may have children together, uh, work together. So it's not always easy to leave. But if a person does the steps to improve themselves and the relationship, the relationship will improve and or they will have the wherewithal, the power, the autonomy, the self-esteem to leave. And that's really important because a, the, a controlling person may have control of all, as an example, all the money. Um, Not so, only that, they will, it, the narcissist doesn't want to be left. People don't no. understand that. They're always afraid to speak up, but they don't want to be left. And they may even put you down, say, well, the grass isn't greener or even threaten you, you'll be sorry. You know, if you file for divorce, you're going to be sorry. You know, you'll regret that you ever did that. It's 
you know, you may win the battle, I'll win the war kind of, you know, talk to intimidate you. So you have to build up your, uh, your army, <laughs> your inner army, your resources, and, and, not, and learn not to react to that kind of control, put downs and intimidation. Exactly. And that, that is really important for, for people to consider today. And if you're in one of those relationships um, and it's abusive, uh, there is organ there is there are organizations that you can go to uh, look them up in on uh, Google them and there are organizations that you can go to get help um, and if you want to go talk to Darlene if they want to talk to you how do they get a hold of you well uh, they can email me it's all on my website what is codependency.com or just Google my name Darlene Lancer and I I have over 200 blogs on my website and they appear other places too. So I yep, have a you, YouTube channel and I'm on Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, you come I, up number one on Google, by the way. <laughs> okay. So, so you've, you've, you've done, you've done really quite well. Will you come back and with, cause I would like to, there's so much more to talk about okay. um, in this, in this whole realm of, of how to survive it, how to get out of it. Um, how to raise your self-esteem. Um, it's, it's, I think it's one of the bigger, biggest questions of our time. And, Thank it, you. I would and like you can to also that. join her mailing list and mm -hmm. she, you'll receive 14 tips for letting go, uh, which is, which is really a, a, a good thing. So uh, Darlene, Lancer has been our guest today. I want to thank you very much for being here and you're going to have to come back because we've got so much more to talk about. Can I say a closing suggestion to your audience? You may. Okay. I just want to say to anybody, if you think you're being abused, you probably are. And the tendency is to, because of shame, to not to tell anyone and to, to keep it to yourself, do the opposite. Get help, talk to people, get objective feedback, and uh, get resources that can help you. And thank you very much for the opportunity to share. Very well said. Very well said. And and remember to uh, get the help that you need and then go see someone who can be your therapist, who can teach you how not to date the same guy in a different suit, <laughs> which, which would be because there are good men out there. Oh, there maybe, are maybe one or two, but there are <laughs> there are good people out there that you can that you can date. Darlene, thank you so much for being on the show. I've got I've got to run, but uh, okay, I want to have you back on the show. Can we do that? Of course.